gotta say, I am fantastic, la la la. I am fantastic. We'll just start again. So I was asking, of, are there are there uh, are there Martians? Oh yes. Uh, well, there. All the planets of the solar system are inhabited, and uh, they're either inhabited by indigenous life or life brought here from other places in the universe. I, I'd like to add a little something to that. Now, Raymond has informed me, this comes from my brother Raymond, that, uh, for instance, uh, Mercury is, uh, they do have outposts there, there's not a lot going on, and some of the planets are covered in ice, but the they do have habitations. It's not generally life as we know it. And on Saturn and Jupiter, most of the life is on the moons. The thing I wanted to mention also was when the Norcans came from the Tau Ceti system uh, 25 million years ago to establish colonies on uh, Venus, they had to contact the native inhabitants. Now realize that the extraterrestrials uh, are in a much more sensitive spiritual development, and they were, they're somewhat telepathic for the most part. And that native inhabitants on Venus were the bumblebee, oh. five-foot bumblebees. And during his time on Venus, he met the bees. So because of your association with the bees, we're very attracted to your pen. You'll notice I have a, a bee pen, and tonight you'll hear about that. So. Uh, I'm going to give it back to Raymond, but I did want to share that information about the bumblebees. Well, yeah, um, in my logo, it represents pollinating positivity, and the movement is cultivating civility, being fantastic. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated to hear all this. Um, I lost track for a second. I was going to ask another question um, about um, the extraterrestrials. Um, uh, but, you, had, uh, you had asked him about life on Mars and Venus. He was telling you about all of them. I just wanted to clarify because there's not like on, on Saturn and on Jupiter wouldn't it wouldn't be on the okay surface. I know what I want to say uh, one of my theories about the future of humans um, and 50 maybe 100 years from now is we won't speak in a language because I think it's archaic to express yourself in a language I, I can only imagine that extraterrestrials speak or uh, communicate telepathically because um, the mind we're only using a couple percentages of it Imagine Venetians are using probably maybe 70, 80 percent. Do you know the percentage for Venetians? Oh, oh yes. Well, uh, most of the women are telepathic, and about half the male population is, is, is telepathic. Because they're not going to come here and speak English when there's French and Italian and right. Chinese. They, they speak all languages. They speak so all they, languages. Okay. They can come here. They can. They have a very advanced learning system where they use the technology that downloads the information oh. directly into their mind, and, but they do have to uh, utilize it. So they have a huge station, there's a, a spaceship called the Dark Knight, and let me just show you this poster real quick. This is a, the, the actual ship. It's, it sits 150 miles above the Earth, and this is a Venusian sanctuary ship that is used to um, actually train extraterrestrials coming to Earth about life on Earth, our problems here. This particular uh, ship is called Victor One. This is a, a large ship and there's about 250 of these existing in the physical and each of these physical ships has as their complement um, some ships that are kind of in the higher dimensions. They monitor all thoughts of beings. Now, they contacted uh, President Eisenhower and offered to help. And him and Nixon actually uh, wanted to possibly take the Venusians up on the offers, but all the government wanted uh, at that time was technology. And well, Boeing went on record to say that all, all our fancy uh, aircraft are reverse engineered. And you know, the, the guy who ran Boeing said that uh, well, on record. Well, the, Venusians are very careful with the technology. So um, th this information, as, as I said, uh, comes from Raymond. And, and these books of his are very important for people and uh, our, our light worker community to read. And uh, as you have conversations with Raymond here, you get a tremendous amount of knowledge in regards to 
right to the center of the I, system. I just wanted to say about bioenergetic communications or telepathic communications are very important to the Venusians and have been to other extraterrestrial species as well because this type of communication in space avoids the intercept and uh, allows information to uh, be processed at the speed of thought, which is much faster than the speed of light, and, there, and therefore our scientists and military personnel on Earth uh, can't uh, get wind of the plans that the Venusians have that are working on behalf of the light and the good. So how many Venusians are you communicating with today? I'm, I'm communicating with uh, uh, various parties of Venusians. I can't tell you, I'm not at liberty to say how many, but I can say that there are safe houses all over the earth, and uh, there's about a contingent of 7,000, an angel course with Dr. Frank Strange's call, uh, here on the earth today. Are they camera shy? Can, can Dr. Fantastic interview one? <laughs> I interviewed one, and, uh, if you want, uh, uh, in a, addition to this, I will send you a link and you can play. I have voice recorded messages of them answering questions and uh, actually a real interview that was... Maybe uh, we could do a podcast we with one of them? Arrange it. I could be happy to do that. We could do a further interview with the three of us at the, in the future. Well, what I do is um, when I find something of extreme interest, because my whole show is about bringing knowledge and information to people. Um, I, it's called a trifecta. The first leg is uh, the YouTube interview, which we're doing now. The second leg is a podcast. And if that's as, as interesting as the first leg, we do, I have you on my radio show, which is an hour long, and we talk about oh, oh, okay, awesome. things that interest us, which in, my, in this case is extraterrestrials. Well, they don't like the term UFO because they're not unidentified. I met one in Las Vegas, uh, one that was on the, uh, in, in a book called The Stranger at the Pentagon when Valiant Thor, and her name was Jill. She looked exactly the same, and I kind of recognized her. And so there's a protocol, and I've recognized a lot of them. They will not openly admit that they're extraterrestrial often, uh, but uh, it's a telepathic knowing that I have, and I get a communication. So I said to her, I said, have you ever seen a UFO? And she said, UFO, no. And I kind of thought, hmm. And she said, but I saw a spaceship in New Jersey. And there's a famous picture of Valiant Thor, her, uh, Vice Commander Don, and another woman named Tanya that Raymond says is a communication specialist in Highbridge, New Jersey in 1957, um, where he appeared and the photograph was taken. They did not physically announce that they were Venusians, like in the interview that he's arranged with me and given a direct message, but uh, they were conversing with people from around the world, French, Russian, and including uh, an African Zotian dialect where Valiant thought, you know, talking. Uh, I heard of Valiant before, I've heard of him. A uh, click language. Yeah. So I met that woman and she said, I've seen a space. So they don't like UFOs, yeah. they don't like the term alien. They are our family, they've been guarding the Earth. And uh, I learned from Raymond that actually they were instrumental in the Revolutionary War, in the French Revolution, in the Caribbean Revolution, and the South American Revolution. And I knew they were very peaceful. I said, they were involved in the revolution? He said, no. What they did was they were appearing to Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, Thomas Paine, Samuel Adams, John Adams, and they were giving them information. And you will see this in the lecture, or in the, tonight, and in our recorded interview, she mentions uh, that she taught them fraternity, equality, liberty, and justice. So they did uh, encourage them to resist tyranny and to act only in defense. And that's why they're here in ever-increasing numbers. She said that our weapon delivery systems um, and artificial intelligence require them to monitor us very closely. So they have a series of stations around the Earth. They work with the civilizations inside the Earth, known as the Great White Brotherhood, 
and sisterhood, and they're working on the surface, contacting elements of our intelligence. Okay, we're coming down another 10 minute on the mark here, so let's pause and we'll, 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 we'll it's 3D, so th th this is a technology. So, um, go ahead, finish on that one. Okay, so, so they uh, have been uh, working amongst us and they um, actually uh, work with people. And one of the interesting, cute little things, they do something, they, they wear these little red berets. And the red beret, um, you'll see that they wear this when they come down in public as an angel force. And uh, they actually, Prince called it a raspberry beret. He had a contact. And that symbol that he changed his name to actually is a Venusian symbol. It kind of conveys the, uh, the, the astrology symbol for Mars and Venus. So uh, they're, they're communicating with people. And Raymond has so much information. Again, I just have to. Okay. So I have a fun master. question, and then I have a serious question. Okay. The fun question is there's been on the scene for a long, long time men are from Mars and women are from Venus. Uh -huh. And that's just obviously just silly. But. Um, I don't know if there's meaning to that or not, but the real question I have is time travel. Okay. He's an expert. He time traveled to 1954. I figured he was. Yes. So that's why I, had to, I have well, to ask that. In my in my book, uh, Cosmic Rays: Excellent Venus Adventure, I travel with Lady Orda back to 1954, and then they it, was born. It, it includes newspaper articles, actual photographs taken back then. And, uh, so you took a camera with you? Uh, no, uh, a reporter from uh, a newspaper in Los Angeles uh, by, the, uh, by the name of Dwiggins. Uh, he took the photographs and they were published in the papers, but they, they didn't appear on, on our time plane until uh, after, the book, after the book came out. So, uh, so the pictures were taken of you in 54? Uh, yes. But the, uh, he went back, and the timeline was in 2013. Right. So people talk about this, and they did. It, it wasn't intended for them to land. There was a technology called the tachyon drive of this bilocation signal from Venus. They were sitting on Venus and looking. But what happened was, is the radiation experiment caused the ship signal to break, and they ended up falling to Earth and crashing in 1954. Now in our timeline, that picture wasn't available until 2013, then it appeared in 1954. And because it was the first space convention, there were other contactees who got them in contact with some Venusians. You have to read about this in the third book on Amazon, The Venus Rising Trilogy by Dr. Raymond Keller. We were at first, at first going to go back to Mount Palomar with uh, George Adamski, Daniel Fry, and Truman Bathurum on the 9th of August of 1954. But the Queen said she couldn't be at the same time and location where she was back then uh, because it would, uh, it, it would be disastrous. So I said, well, in researching the contactees and the beginnings of the flying saucer phenomena, what if we go back to the first convention at Giant Rock because she was with George Adamski in Europe at that time and uh, so she agreed to that but there were atomic testing going on a w about a week before and a week after uh, the, the flying saucer convention spacecraft convention and it caused it caused uh, 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 tachyon flux moving back backwards and forwards into time, which caused our, our time probe to slip out of synchronization uh, with, the, with the base on Venus. And so we crashed in 1954. And how we got back to Earth in the present time is the subject of Venus rising. And I'm still not sure that I'm in the correct timeline. <laughs> I, but we, we sort of tweaked your time continuum so I'm sorry for that, but uh, but no harm is apparently done. But is the theory correct if you try to change something in the past? I uh, know we only screws went up the future. Uh, yes, well, we only went there to observe, but we did affect minor changes in Earth's history, and it, and it's ex we tried to keep it at a low level intensity, and it's all described in.
cosmic rays, excellent Venus adventure. <laughs> he provides a tremendous amount of metaphysical knowledge that is couched within this trilogy. He has an, everything is annotated, and there are, is actually a picture of him um, with this woman. I want you to see it um, here. Um, you can go back. No, no, this is okay, so uh, there's a picture of him with this woman in one of these books when he's 18, and here he is with her in our timeline of 2013, but um, he's old and she's still young. They have a technology that um, is called the Vril that was developed uh, millions of years ago in another system that allows, and they speak about this in some of the messages that you may hear if we do a radio show, that they, by exposing the nucleonic acids of the cells to certain types of radiation, it creates a temporal ceiling and activates the actual DNA um, to its perfected state. So they never look, I've never seen a Venusian that looks over 29 or 30. So they live a very long age. And in the interview, I met actually a Venusian. How long did they live for? One, the, this particular Venusian, uh, uh, Raymond has indicated that he was born in uh, uh, 600 BC under the first Persian Empire, Emperor Darius the Great. Because we weren't designed to age. If you keep your telomeres healthy, you won't age, is what I've been told. Right. You can live 10,000 years. You eventually have to pass away if you're born on the third or the fourth dimension, like Venus, which is the fourth dimension on his time. But uh, he was 2,400 years. He was a beekeeper or a magi in the Zoroastrian tradition, and he now um, works um, as the head of the security for the Queen of Venus, uh, called the Shar Sharuna. And um, so. I just wanted to share that part about uh, the, the longevity aspect. How long are you going to live for? Uh, well, I don't plan on dying on the physical plane. I, I expect that I'll be translated, bodily ascended up into Venus. So if you, if you go into Venus now, you, it's going to extend your life at some point? or? Uh, yeah. Yes, I would be extended for... Uh, and or rejuvenated. Or, now, how do you get the ticket? Go back. I mean, well, I actually received my ticket. I was at um, uh, a metaphysical convention in Columbus, Ohio, at the uh, at the uh, downtown Expo Center, and uh, I was approached by a woman who identified herself as a uh, an emissary from Venus. He gave me a, a lot of information about the actual files of a contactee named Truman Bathurum, his letters and correspondence, as well as gave me a, a one-way ticket to the moon base Clarion. And I actually have the ticket. Well, and, and it's redeemable for a one-way trip. So <laughs> I'm going to, I am going to use it. It's fantastic. I, I want to say one thing. You set a ticket, and so he loves this pop cultural reference. He doesn't need a ticket, but this technology, he's old, he has a metal in his leg, one is shorter than the other, but this technology is a, called translation. So they will rejuvenate his body through a series of things that will bring him back to the age of 18. Uh, the Mormon saint that he met on the mountain in Mount Shasta, she was in a bilocation signal. Her name was Annalee Scarin. She was a Mormon saint and she was very old and she had lost her teeth and um, she had ascended from Mount Shasta in front of a, a reverend who left the church with her and arranged the meeting with Raymond and he, she, was looking young and she ascend, ascended in a similar uh, transportation vehicle that Raymond uh, ascended in. This transportation vehicle is known as a Nimbus and when it's at rest it folds out like a lotus and it can seat two or three people and this lotus, if you think about the Buddhist Tonkas, you see all the Buddhas floating in the sky? in these lotus blossoms, 
These are the Venusian transport vehicles, right, Raymond? Yes. Okay, just pause for another minute. You can believe it, it's been another 10 minutes. Okay, hold on one I'm second. I'm gonna let you continue with him. I, okay. I, gotta, I gotta go somewhere. Okay. Okay, um, I'm back on, I think this is part four of the interview with Raymond Keller, author of Venus Rising, the trilogy. And uh, I couldn't be more excited to meet you and uh, hear um, what's in that head of yours. <laughs> and you must have a fantastic memory. Well, thank you. Uh, all my, all my uh, books are fully footnoted and documented according to Chicago Manual of Style, 14th edition. There's over 600 footnotes in the first, uh, uh, in the first book alone. Oh, is that right? So it's not science fiction. Right, right. And well, I have a couple more questions. People can check it out. Because uh, now that I have the famous Raymond Keller in front of me, <laughs> I need some answers. How did the hell did they build the pyramids? Okay, um, well, um, first off, our ancestors weren't as dumb as some people would like to make them out to be. Okay. Um, they did have some help with the extraterrestrials as far as the alignment of the pyramids. And we see that the uh, pyramids in Egypt are built, and the Great Pyramid Complex and so forth, is built uh, along the lines of the constellation of Orion, uh, as are the temple complexes at Chichen Itza and other places in the Americas, as well as the Sidonia region on, on Mars. So there is a a spiritual and metaphysical and astronomical significance to all these structures. Right. So, um, I mean, I, I watched the revelation of the pyramids, uh -huh. and I watched a lot of documentaries with, or, or with showing artifacts from our history that we can't create today. With, with the tools and the technology that we have, we can't do it today. And uh, there's no recorded history of how the pyramids were made, you know? Um, the granite, bowls and urns that they've carved with tools that don't but we don't have a trace of any of the tools I mean it's just so many so many mind-boggling artifacts that are physically on the planet today you know and there's no um, there's no answer there's a federation out there that consists of 601 planets and 51 star systems and whenever we enter a planetary system and we uh, uh, we, we leave it, whether we're doing research, historical, or um, documentary, or scientific, we can't leave any artifacts behind. And so that's why in, uh, in uh, Cosmic Ray's Excellent Venus Adventure, uh, we have photographs that were taken by the reporter from the Los Angeles newspaper uh, where we're detonating the time probe and blowing up the remains of it, disintegrating it so that uh, it wouldn't be found by Air Force authorities back in Air Force Office of Special Intelligence, a FOSI, back in the uh, spring of uh, 1954. I've often thought that if everything was annihilated on the planet except for one item, we only need one item to have survived to show that there was an entire civilization. It could be this string around your neck. <laughs> Anything that was manufactured shows a civilization, right? Well, ev everything that's out of its sequence in time leaves a mark or a signature. So they have a, a group on Venus called the Metrons, and when something is shown to be out of synchronization with the timeline, we can dispatch, uh, we can dispatch uh, personnel uh, backwards or forwards in time to retrieve it and uh, and either bring it back or destroy it. What drives you, what, 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 what answers do you want out there? I mean, do you have all the answers or you're still scratching to, to learn more? Oh no, there's always something to learn. It's like a vast spiral staircase into infinity. We're always growing and we're ever learning. And uh, one day, uh, we will be as the Venusians are, because what, what? Are they the most advanced? Once upon a time, they were like us. Were they, they, are they the most advanced society? Uh, yes, the Venusians. Um, yes. Because you know, there's that infinity word. You know, I've always felt was never ending. It's actually never beginning either. Right. So uh, um, people say, well, there's probably a couple other planets out there or life forms. There's infinite life forms. So that means uh, if you're saying 25 million years or whatever it is. For Venetians, there's 
far older civilizations, right? Yes, there are actually more than 60 planets in our solar system, although only 12 of them are visible. Oh. Um, and their moons, their attendant moons. But there are 60 planets, and this was revealed by me, Lane, and Mark Probert of the Borderland Sciences Research Association out of San Diego. They did their research back in the late 1940s. And this was confirmed by theosophists uh, of the time, like George Adamski uh, and, and others, as well as real astronomers at the Jordell Bank uh, Observatory and Radio Telescope. My big question, another big question I have is, you know, there's many people that have proved, you know, with old photographs and just all the things we've been talking about that there's been visitation. Why do they have SETI? Um, Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, or SETI, is no longer funded by the federal government, but by, but by uh, private donors. Right. Although I'm sure that the government has its foot in extraterrestrial research. In my second book, The Final Countdown Rockets to Venus, I explore an operation, a secret operation in the government and the Air Force called Project White Stork. Project White Stork looked at the efforts of the Soviet Union back in the 1960s uh, to discover extraterrestrial life. And uh, it goes into great detail into Project White Stork and its findings about what was going on in, in Russia. And the search for extraterrestrial took life took a high priority in the Soviet Union because there was a uh, a, a saucer that crashed back in Siberia in June of 1908. And uh, they had a jump start on us in exploring extraterrestrial contacts. And with the communist view, materialist view of the evolution of life, they said that intelligence was an inherent outcome from the evolution of life. And so this, this search for extraterrestrial intelligence, or SETI, was much in line with the philosophy of the scientific community and the Soviet Academy of Sciences. But why aren't they showing any, any communication? They have communication, and I detail in great... Well, they're not uh, sharing it with us then? Uh, well, I, Steady? I found out in the, through my research and provide lots of information in my book, Final Countdown Rockets to Venus, about just what the Russians really found out and uh, what they were doing as far as extraterrestrial research and, and even fabricating their own types of revolutionary space drives. You've got a lo whole lot of knowledge up there. <laughs> oh yeah, it's all documented. Anything, can, Everything in these books can be checked out. And you, not, you're having some upcoming books as well? You're going to keep writing? Uh, yes, I'm working, on, uh, I'm working on one now. And um, it's... Uh, it's going to be a blockbuster containing a whole new information, brand new photographs never before seen of Commander Aura Reigns and uh, uh, many others, uh, Venusians that, are, that have been here on Earth. And um, I'm yet working on another one even, uh, even after that, which chronicles the entire history of one, of one Venusian on Earth. When are you going to turn your books into a, a documentary? Uh, well, I've been approached by uh, by some directors in in Hollywood about doing a series, but I, I, I'm not a privilege to say right now. Because I'm a producer. <laughs> oh, oh, who that is? Uh, and I love the subject, and you know, so obviously it's a, it's a natural progression to go from books to video because yeah. people don't read, you know, they want to see pictures. It's easier. And all, all the books are fully illustrated. There's over a hundred photos in each, some in color. And I'll be up in Mount Shasta this summer. Well, back if you give me a press cap pass, I'll come visit. Yeah, back in 2018, we had the first From Venus with Love conference. And I was up there with the beautiful Omnek Onek. That's her picture right there. She's a Venetian? Uh, she's the ambassador from the fifth dimensional level. Of Where does she live? Um, she, I can't give you her oh. address. She doesn't want it. United no. States. It's in the Midwest. Midwest, yeah. 
Well, we're coming to another, another end of a 10-minute segment. You want to keep continuing talking? Oh, uh, this is fine because I've got to okay. take care of stuff. It was wonderful meeting you. Thank you, sir. Much And we'll pleasure. stay in touch. I'd love to come and, and cover some other stories for you. Thank you. And you have my card with yes. contact information. Very good. Thank you so much. Gotta say, I am fantastic.